All right, so this lecture is going to be recorded, um, as will all of them. I'll try to put them up within a day or so of the lecture, uh, but my laptop can't really do anything besides processing that video uh, while, while it's doing that, so sometimes it uh, might take me a little longer. But there are two previous quarters of me giving almost the exact same lectures uh, up on my YouTube channel as well, so if you're ever in a rush to see them or watch it beforehand or whatever, you can access those. Um, okay, so my name's Jake. Um, I will be your lecturer for this quarter. Um, there is also another lecturer teaching 7B that does the C and D sections. Um, her name is Armella. Um, your head TA is named Rodrigo. He, some of you will have him for DL. Um, the two of us are kind of the, the leads for the course. Uh, you can reach out to both or either of us about pretty much any issue you have or comment, question, whatever. Um, although I would be the main contact for stuff related to lecture and grading and quizzes and, well, I'll get into grading in a sec, but like quiz information and stuff like that. Um, and he is in charge of like DLs and TAs. Um, but if you wanna be safe, any course question you have, it's never a bad idea to include both of us and maybe your TA too, whatever you're comfortable with, um, and we will communicate with each other to, to answer your question. Um, we also have a grader this quarter that's kind of new for seven series. Um, instead of your TA or I grading stuff, one person is going to be grading everything for the course. Um, that person's name is Miranda, and you can, uh, yeah, so anything with like regrade requests and stuff like that, uh, we're gonna do that all through Gradescope, but she is the one that will be handling that. Um, and all our contact information is up on Canvas as well, but never hesitate to reach out about reach out to any of us about really anything, and again, we'll figure out who needs to hear your question to answer it. Um, right, so your section B, our lectures are from 9 to 10.20 on Tuesdays. Um, we will be using iClicker in this class. Um, this is the code to join it. Um, it's not mandatory. I'm not ever gonna look at it after the lecture. Like, I don't use it for attendance or anything, and lecture attendance is not, I mean, it's recommended, but it's not mandatory. Um, but I think it's a really great tool, not only for you to practice stuff as we go, but also for me to get an idea of how well concepts are landing as we move through it. So it really helps give me some feedback um, to how the class is doing and what I need to spend more time on. So I encourage you to participate in that. Um, about me, I'm a fifth year grad student doing astronomy. Um, this is my third time teaching seven, or lecturing 7B and I've TA'd it many times before that. Um, that being said, I'm like always working on making this class better, or making my presentation of the course better. So don't hesitate to reach out with um, comments, questions, suggestions, um, anything. I'm always looking to improve, and it could be little things like I can't read text on the lectures to bigger things about like how we're splitting stuff up between lecture and DL. Um, yeah, anything is appreciated. Um, I like running, I have two cats. Uh, are shown here. Hopefully we don't have any uh, like remote DLs or lecture type stuff this quarter, but if we do, the one small upside is that you may get to meet them. Uh, okay, most of the course info is already up on Canvas. I know the syllabus needs a little work. There's uh, the attendance policy is incomplete. I need to correct a couple typos in there, and then also office hours are not up yet for all of the TAs. We'll get that completed within, like hopefully by the end of the week or early next week, um, but you don't have a quiz until two weeks from today. Um, so by mid next week, office hours will be available and up and running, and you can go to any of them between the AB sections and CD sections, um, and my, I have mine as I listed here. They're on Mondays um, from one to two in the physics building. Um, I put my office hours two days before the quiz. I, I usually do one day before, but I'm trying to, just to kind of encourage a little more spread out, uh, less cramming for the quizzes, but there should be an office hour to go to every weekday and a couple Zoom options as well. Um, so try a couple if you wanna go to your TAs, anyone else's just to hear something explained differently, and we'll also try to let you know like how we run our office hours, like what we focus on. Um, so lots of options there, and I think it's one of the best ways to keep up to date and catch up if you're struggling or falling behind a little bit. Um, for communication in this course, Piazza is the preferred place to ask like 
course content questions, so things about DLs, FNTs, quiz practice, anything like that, um, because everyone can answer it. So if you haven't used Piazza before, you should evolve, I think, if you're on the Canvas site, be added to that. There's also a tab on the Canvas site to, to link to it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just a great way for you all to answer each other's questions and get, a f I'm sure if you have a question, other people have it, as you've been told a million times before. So you are helping the class a lot by asking a question there instead of just keeping it to yourself and asking one of us individually or you know, chatting with a peer about it. It's also a way that you can earn some participation credit. Um, so the way DL grades work, um, you're like participation, it's worth 5% of your grade. And it's mainly if you show up and participate a bit, you know, like you're, you're an active member of your DL, then you'll get full credit. But if you go above and beyond, there's an opportunity for some people to earn a mid or a high pass, which is like one or three added points on your final average. So it can be pretty significant. Um, and you get those just by being an active, engaged participant in DL. And also, um, if you use Piazza a lot and answer other people's questions and ask questions, um, we do notice that too, and that can count toward your DL grade. The emphasis is not on being correct. Of course, we <laughs> don't give someone the impression that you know exactly what you're talking about and mislead them, but it's an area where we can kind of collaborate and figure out what we don't understand and share different ways of looking at things. So you could very well participate in Piazza all the time and have it mostly be questions and things you're confused about, and I like that just as much as if you're consistently answering people's questions and giving spot on answers. It doesn't matter, I just wanna see participation because that's what is gonna make the class stronger. The same thing goes for DL. Um, which I'll talk about a little more in a sec. Um, but yeah, Piazza is great and I highly encourage that and we'll be checking it a lot. Discord, um, some TAs might check it and it's, it's up to them. I don't really look at Discord very much. I prefer to have that as like kind of an area for you all to, I don't know, chat about stuff and obviously it's not as easy to go back to. Um, so it's not as great for like very involved content questions. But Casey, uh, who's like the seven series tutor, um, is excellent and is not affiliated with the course. Like he's not a TA or an instructor or anything like that. So that's like a great outside resource if you want something explained completely differently and he's very attentive on there. Um, so yeah, Discord is there if you want it. Um, for other questions, it, I mean it can be course content stuff if you really wanna ask something specific to us but anything logistics wise or personal to you, you can use Canvas and email and again to me or Rodrigo, any of the above, and your TA, any of us, um, we're pretty responsive through that as well. Um, final exam's gonna be on a Friday evening, unfortunately. We don't get any control over that, but that's when it's gonna be. Um, there there's no makeups, so it's, it's pretty frustrating. If you can't make the final exam, you have to take an incomplete for the course and make it up another quarter. So really, really make sure that you're there. I mean, it happens, people get sick, there's un not much you can do about it, and we'll try to give you as much support as we can in the quarter when you do end up taking the final to resolve the incomplete. Um, but yeah, you need to be there for the final on Friday, March 24th. Um, this is more to go back to. Um, if you, My lecture slides will always be uploaded in advance on Canvas, so these are a few links to the textbook, my old lecture videos, and uh, the DLs um, for you to click on. Um, so the course load, the textbook is something that you can really, you can get by in this class without ever looking at the textbook. It often goes into more detail on things that you don't really need, but it can be a really solid way to deepen your understanding or just get a quick glimpse, <coughs> excuse me, of the material before DL. So it's a resource that's there, check it out. If it helps you, great. And if you really don't like it, you don't need to use it. But some prep before lecture um, is helpful to absorb stuff. Um, most of you have probably taken a 7, 7A, um, but if you haven't taken a 7 series class before, you spend most of your time in discussion lab, DL, and uh, that's where the majority of the learning happens in this course. So the way it's gonna work is in lecture, I try to keep my lectures in a more introductory style. That doesn't mean we won't do equations and there won't be stuff that's hard and complicated in lecture, but the idea is for this to give you a conceptual understanding and like a familiarity with the topics we have here. I never expect you to leave lecture being able to recite and work with all the things we just talked about immediately. 
but if you can stay engaged and, and get an idea of how to think about these things, DL is when you can then go and work with them hands-on in a group, so you have the support of other people, you're all gonna understand different things, and then when you move on to the FNTs, your homework in between DLs, um, that's when you'll be able to really try it out yourself and do things that are more math intensive. Um, so yeah, the, if you stay engaged in lecture and DL, that should minimize the amount of effort you have to put in outside of those. I'm not saying you'll never have to study, quiz prep is very necessary and useful, but again, if you just kind of coast through lecture and DL, um, you're missing out on really important learning um, in the course and of course participation if you're checked out in DL. So um, yeah, go to DL, participate, um, making your group work together is, is like a high priority for this class, so um, don't be afraid to talk to me or your TA if things aren't working out. TAs all have different kind of philosophies about how to work their DL, whether they're shuffling groups often or not, or you know, all this stuff is uh, changeable, dynamic, so yeah, if you don't, if something's not working for you, let us know and maybe we can change it um, or help you work with it. Um, okay, yeah, when quizzes come around, again, your first one will be in two weeks. Um, you'll have tons of office hours to go to. I'll release a lot of practice quizzes. Those practice quizzes are usually harder than the quizzes I intend to give, and they are sometimes poorly written, which, I mean, I just have a bank of them from earlier quarters, and I'm gonna give you all of them and as many solutions as we have. Um, so I think they are a great resource, um, but they are not to be thought of as like a gold standard for what the quiz is, and you'll get a better feel for that once you see um, some of the quizzes and the practice quizzes. Also, I have some of my old quizzes now, so you can see kind of my quiz writing style. Um, but I'll give you more practice than you sh really should need, or I mean, then I don't expect you to do all of it, um, but there should be abundant resources uh, to prepare for these quizzes. There will be five quizzes. Um, you never have more than two weeks in a row of quizzes, so starting in two weeks, you'll have a quiz, and then one after that, then a week off, then another quiz, then a week off, and then two more quizzes. Um, and they will never come after a holiday week. So you can see on the DL schedule, there's some couple weeks next, I think next week is one of them, where we have Monday and Tuesday with no DLs, no nothing for this class, so you'll never have a quiz coming back from that. You'll always have class right before um, to prepare. Um, yeah, I think that's most of the things I can think of logistics-wise. Uh, you're grading in this course, right? For the quizzes, uh, this, I think on the previous slide I wrote that one quiz will be dropped. Um, that's actually not true. I changed the syllabus. I'm still, I still have to make a couple other notes, but this quarter we're doing something kind of similar where <coughs> at the end of the quarter I'll calculate your grade using both all five quizzes and your final. That's one way of doing it. Or we'll take your four highest quizzes, so essentially dropping one and weighting your final a little bit higher, and I'll just give you whichever of the two is higher. So you don't need to decide which grading scheme you want. I'll just calculate both and give you whatever comes out to be higher. So if you just tank a quiz or you have to miss one, or maybe you do well on all of them and just do slightly less on one, that one might be dropped. Um, and also it kind of weights, if you do well on the final, it'll weight the final higher. So I think it's a good system and it accounts for if you have to miss one due to illness or emergency or something, then of course that one will probably just be dropped. If you have to miss more than one quiz for some sort of emergency, like a valid reason, let me know and we'll, we'll work something out, um, but hopefully that doesn't happen and I encourage you not to skip a quiz just because you know it can be dropped. I, if you can take all five quizzes, put some effort into it and take them because it sets you up, like it gives you this safety in case you do need to miss one and then also it just gives you the best chance at a higher grade. So I encourage you to take all five, but there's a ch if you don't, only four will be graded and your final weight will be increased a little bit. That will all be explained in the syllabus. The other new thing this quarter is that no unexcused absences are allowed in DL. At least you'll, if you miss one, then you'll lose a point, I believe, from your participation grade. Um, I guess a low pass is what that's called. But that doesn't mean that you, have to, <laughs> that you can never have a sick day or something like that. We have lab reports um, that you can do instead, which is essentially working through the DL on your own. Um, you can, of course, ask us questions and everything. It's, it's more to just keep you caught up um, than it is a way to like grade you on 
how well you understood it. They're just graded for effort and completion. Um, but yeah, if you have to miss the L, the number one way to do that is just attend another section, especially since there's CD sections as well. There's, I think, there's somewhere in the teens, like mid-teens of other DLs occurring. So depending on when your DL is that you're missing, just let the other TA know and you can attend their section instead. That doesn't count as any sort of absence, it's just making up the DL. We'll communicate about it and you'll get full points. If you can't do that for whatever reason, everyone gets one DL report with like zero, with no excuse, like you can just do that. If you miss one DL and you can't make up in another section, you don't need any sort of documentation, you can just submit a DL report. The instructions will be on Canvas and we'll talk about it a little more. Um, but you can just do that. If you have to miss more than that, then uh, talk to us and then we can, you know, we can provide some sort of documentation or excuse, I don't know. But talk to us if you need to do more than one lab report. Um, as far as attending other sections to make up DLs, um, I think it's a limit of four. Yeah, so basically, you. Whenever you miss, you should make it up in another DL, but that cannot be your default. So you can't just hop around sections and just, you need to attend your section first and almost always, and then that's a, that's a backup. Okay, any questions? I'm sure I'm missing stuff. I'll post the Canvas announcement later on with, with more logistics stuff and, and make sure the syllabus is correct. But are there any logistics course flow type stuff that anyone wants to ask before we move on? Yeah, so your quizzes will be right at the beginning of class from 9 to 9.20. Um, like I said, lectures are not mandatory, so I, I get encouraged, but if you want to only come to lecture to take your quiz, um, we ask that you, yeah, I mean, basically when you, when you finish your quiz, you can leave, but just be mindful of people that are still taking them um, and do so with as little disturbance as possible. Um, but yeah, quizzes will be from 9 to 9.20. On those quiz days. Yes. So I'll answer both of those. The first, the style of the quiz is very much like the practice problems, where it's generally like one problem set up and then a couple questions open ended on it, or like analytical, like you'll have to write out some, do some work, and sometimes a short answer, like a quick con conceptual explanation or something like that, but it's generally, again, like one setup and then a couple questions about it. Um, sometimes there might be like a, another thing added on, but they're, they're designed to be finished in 20 minutes. As far as the difficulty level compared to the practice problems, like I said, a lot of the practice problems from other lecturers in the past, I think are a bit harder than the ones I intend to give. Um, but as a result, they're, they're good prep. And you, now also I do have two past quizzes that I've written, so you can get a feel for what the difficulty I intend to make them. Um, but as far as the difficult, like what I'm aiming for, I just, like I wanna curve the class as little as possible. So if I want the average to turn up around like a high C, low B, like I guess an 80-ish average is what I'm mandated to, to produce then I would rather give a quiz that gives us about an 80% average. I don't want to give the whole class 50s and have to curve the class hugely, because um, then you just have no idea how you're doing until the end of the quarter. Um, so yeah, I'll try my best there, and of course, we'll, I'll adapt as the quarter goes to make sure that we're on the right track for that. Um, I will curve the class, but that will be at the end of the course. So once the final's over, I'll curve all our final grades, and then your potential bonus from DL extra credit will be like a mid pass or a high pass will be added on to that. Um, but you will not see like curved values for the individual quizzes. I'll tell you what like the mean and standard deviation was um, so you can get a feel for where you are in the course. Any other questions? All right, let's get into the material then. So like 7A, um, 7B is organized as a bunch of like models that will learn to describe different phys physical phenomena. Um, they're listed here, but the first one we're gonna talk about is steady state energy density, or the steady state energy density model where we look at fluid systems and then move into electrical circuits. Um, this is one piece that's very different than a lot of uh, physics courses you would normally see. I mean, this is a, 
typical like important physics topic, but the ordering is kind of interesting. Um, but I think it, it fits well here, and having fluid systems as a precursor to electrical circuits, I think, is, uh, is really nice. So today, we're going to talk about fluid flow. We're going to talk about conservation of both energy density systems and current, and we'll define what those things are. Um, and then we'll talk about how to describe the different fluid energy density systems um, with something called the Bernoulli equation, um, which puts these all together. And the complete Bernoulli equation is going to be what we work with for, uh, I think, the next couple weeks. But it's just one equation that is very powerful um, and will apply to a lot of different fluid flow scenarios. OK, so we, I said we would talk about energy density. So first, let's be clear what that is. Um, energy, you've talked about. That's what all of 7a is about. Um, energy takes many forms. There's thermal energy, kinetic energy, potential, so on and so forth. Um, but we usually talk about it in amounts. It's measured in joules. Um, so like this, just two arbitrary amounts of energy, saying like there's a one centimeter cubed cube that has one joule of energy in it. Great. There could also be this meter cubed cube, much bigger. Uh, that has a million joules of energy in this. So uh, that's two examples of systems that we both know the size and the amount of energy in. Great. Uh, however, we could also describe the energy density of the same two systems, in which case the first one, we would have an energy density of one joule per cubic centimeter. And for the second one, we have a million joules in a cubic meter, which works out to one joule per cubic centimeter, or the same energy density as the smaller system. So energy density is a way that we can describe these two systems in a way that relates them, shows the similarity, that they have the same energy density, the same amount of energy per unit volume, despite the other one being a million times bigger than the other. So they're good for different things, right? Energy is good for describing the total. Energy density is good for describing the characteristics of it, its behavior, um, when we don't necessarily care how much of it there is. And we'll talk about why that's useful for us soon. And energy density is just energy divided by volume. Uh, conservation is another important topic. And conservation really just means like what goes in must come out. right? You can't create or destroy energy or matter. Um, whatever is in a system has, is, is all you got to work with. And that's true for energy and fluid in the case of fluid systems. Um, so when does like how do we apply conservation? Like what, where, and when is it conserved? Like what is it constant over? Um, so in seven A, we talked about energy changing over time, right? We had a certain amount of energy, let's say ten joules, and a certain amount of matter, so like two molecules at time A, at point A, time zero. And then after some delta t, some amount of time elapses, we have the same. Two molecules, 10 joules. So that's conservation of energy over time. Now in 7b, one change, like I said, we're talking about energy density. So instead of 10 joules, we're talking about 10 joules maybe per meter cubed or something. But we're talking about energy density. And we're also conserving, not over time, not when, but over space. Where? Like, so at different points in a fluid system, and this is just a one snapshot in time. So the, all of this is happening at one time. Fluid's flowing through the circuit. At point A, I have one energy density. That means at point B, I have to have the same energy density. We're saying energy is conserved over space throughout our fluid circuit, that our total energy density is conserved over spatial position or different energy density systems change over spatial position. We'll talk more about that. Um, but this is true because we're talk this is independent of time. So if we use the terminology or way of looking at things as 7a, energy density changing over time, this would all be very boring. Because steady state fluid systems have behavior that's independent of time. So, so if we just looked at a snapshot of a system and looked at its changes, at each point over time, there would be no change. Because again, it's constant. The behavior is steady state. But if we look at different pieces of the circuit at the same time, there might be changes throughout space. So we'll get an example of that soon. Um, why? Well, 
Well, the changes in position, they just kind of address that, but there is no change in time. Right? We have a spread out over space fluid circuit, and so we're looking at changes in position in it because it's constant in time or steady state. Why do we care about energy density? So why do we make that transition to talking about energy per unit volume instead of just total energy? Well, if we think about these two systems I have drawn here, we don't really know anything about fluid flow yet, but let's just use our intuition. We have two pipes with fluid flowing through them. They're the exact same in every way, like material, size, amount of fluid flowing through them, whatever. Just this one is a bit longer than the other. That's the only difference between these two. We'd expect them to behave really similar. And what I mean by that is like, let's say we just zoomed in at one point in the middle of each one of them. We would expect to see the same thing, right? It's fluid flowing through a pipe. It's gonna look the same no matter that pipe is a meter long or a mile long. But if we were talking about total energy, the pipe that is a mile long is going to have a lot more energy associated, it, associated with it than the meter long pipe, right? So that difference may be useful in some senses, like if we, if we care that this pipe contains a lot more total fluid, a lot more total energy density, or total energy, great. But in this case, we don't. We care about the behavior of a system at different points throughout the system. So if we just care about the behavior and we just wanna zoom in, then we wanna talk about energy density. Because again, we don't care about how much there is total, we just care about the behavior at different points. And so energy density allows us to disregard the distinctions that we don't care about. For instance, the size of the system. So increasing the length of the pipe won't change its behavior, therefore we wanna talk about it in a way that's independent of the length of this pipe. And that happens to be talking about its energy density instead of its uh, total energy. Um, the same goes to the way we describe amounts. I don't care if there's two liters of fluid in a system or two milliliters of fluid in a system. I care about the flow of that over time. But we'll talk about that uh, right now, I guess. So to talk about the flow of fluid, we need to define current. More specifically, steady state current, which just means that the current is constant in time. Current, flow rate, those two are synonyms. They mean the same thing, and I'll use them interchangeably throughout the lecture and the course. But it just talks about, it addresses the amount of fluid flowing per time. So I, like this is a kind of similar argument to why we talk about energy density, because we care about the behavior. We're not talking about the total amount of fluid. We're just we're zooming in at one point, looking at the behavior. So we just care about the amount of fluid that's flowing through any point per unit time. Again, behavior, not describing the total system. So we have a system here. I mean, we don't normally talk about fluid flow in terms of molecules, but just to visualize it, if I have two molecules flowing through point A, two molecules coming out of point B, what we're missing, we have an amount of fluid, what we're missing is this per unit time piece. So if I wanted to know what the flow rate is here, I would need to know like two molecules per second or per minute or whatever. Those are both absurdly small flow rates, but still gives you an idea of what we're trying to address, which is how much is passing through each point in a given interval of time. And we can define that with just current is volume of fluid flowing per time. That's our current, that's our flow rate. And I is the symbol that we're gonna use to describe that. So you'll see that a ton. I, our flow rate, is the amount of fluid flowing through a circuit per unit time. Instead of molecules per time, we're usually gonna talk about volume, right? That's how we measure fluids. So in this case, it could be one meter cube per second or two milliliters per hour, whatever. We'll do some unit conversion and stuff, but in general, as long as you have a volume on top and a time on the bottom, that gives us a current, a flow rate, an amount per time. Um, another thing just to mention here, I keep saying like points, like point A, point B, Another, I guess a more accurate way to think of that would be like, almost like a gate. That's how I think of it. Like if you just took a cross section, how much fluid is passing through this plane, this slice that we call A at one point? How, much, how many like water molecules are penetrating A over a given amount of time? How many are slipping by this place? Same thing with B. How much water is passing through this plane, this slice, this gate of B? in a given amount of time. Um, it's not necessarily a point because there, you know, there's cross-sectional area to a pipe. 
Okay, so current is volume over time. How do we calculate it? Uh, well, to do this, we're gonna, you're not responsible for this little like kind of derivation thing. I just think it's useful um, to illustrate it. If we imagine just a section of a fluid system here, so we have a pipe with fluid in it that's flowing from left to right, and we're just gonna pick a volume of that pipe, just pick a section of it. That's the light blue highlighted piece here. And we're gonna ask ourselves, how quickly is the fluid in this section going to be replaced, is one way to think about it. So to, like, to, de to define the rate of fluid flow, how much fluid is making, our way, is making its way through this pipe in a given amount of time, we're just gonna take a section and see how long it takes for that section, which we know its volume, to be replaced by fluid. And then that'll tell us kind of the turnover, the flow rate, our current. So to do that, first we need to define the volume of this section. And the volume of a cylinder here is just the cross-sectional area, A, uh, times the length of that section. And this is wrong here. I said cross-sectional area is meters cubed. That should be meters squared, but we're not worried about that necessarily right now. It's just area, cross-sectional area times the length. That's gonna give us the volume of this piece that we're concerned about. And then the other thing we're concerned about is the amount of time it takes to be replaced. And so the way we're gonna link those two is by relating the length of this section to the speed of the flow. That's our, our key that tells us how quickly this unit of the pipe is going to be replaced is, well, how fast is the water moving through it? So the way we'll do that is this S1, this length of a section, we can also define as the speed of the fluid moving through it times however long it takes for the fluid to get through it, right? We have a distance, distance is equal to velocity or speed times time, right? That gives us how far the fluid moves in this delta T. So now our volume is our cross-sectional area times our speed times the change in time. That's giving us the volume of this chunk in terms of the amount of time that we allow to elapse, right? Because if we say our time interval is gonna be one second, then okay, that gives us a certain amount of fluid that's gonna turn over in one second, but if we make that 10 seconds, it's gonna give us a bigger volume. It actually doesn't matter what delta T we pick, but whatever delta T we pick is going to determine the volume. Then, to evaluate what our current is, our flow, our volume per time, how quickly it's going to turn over, we know that our current, I, is equal to our volume, divided by that time interval, right? So the volume that's being replaced divided by the amount of time it takes to replace it. And if we do that, we see magically that the delta t's cancel out. And we just get that the current, I, is equal to the cross-sectional area times the speed of the flow. So I guess what we found is like the, the, the delta t doesn't matter. The, the size of the original volume that we were considering doesn't matter. It just boils down to how wide is the pipe and how fast is the fluid flowing through it, which kind of makes sense, right? If I <laughs> keep the speed of the fluid flowing the same, but I make the pipe twice the cross-sectional area, well, then I'm gonna get a lot more fluid flowing through that pipe because the fluid has a lot more space to go through and it's moving at the same speed. So if I double the cross-sectional area, I'll double the flow rate. Same thing goes for the speed. Remember the flow rate is how much volume is making it way, its way through this gate in a unit of time. If I keep the area the same, but double the speed of the fluid, I'm also gonna double the flow rate. Because if I, the fluid is going through at twice the speed, in every given time interval, twice as much fluid is going to make it through. So again, this was just to kind of give you an idea of where it comes from, but the key takeaway here is that our current is just equal to the cross-sectional area times the speed. And that just tells us again how much volume is flowing through each point in the circuit per time. Okay, so now we've defined current and we know how to relate it to the physical characteristics of our system, the size of the pipe and the speed of the fluid. What can we say about current in a circuit? Well, like I said before, current is conserved. So we know in conservation in this case is a conservation based on space. So if I have current at point one here in cross section or volume one of the pipe, I have some current over here, that current is conserved. So it's whatever the current is on the left is the same 
as the current on the right. Again, the current is the same, and it turns out everywhere within a steady state fluid system. If I have one steady state fluid system, the current at every single point along that system is going to be the same. So again, current is A1 times V1, or cross-sectional area times speed. So my current in pipe section one is A1 times V1. My current in pipe section two is A2 times V2. But those things have to be equal to each other because current is conserved. The current in one is the same as the current in two, so I get this relationship. Clearly, the areas are not the same. A1 does not equal A2. Pipe two has a larger cross-sectional area. So what does that mean? Well, just that the speeds also have to be different. And we'll look at that in a little bit. But current can be conserved even if the fluid is moving faster in some parts of the pipe and slower in other parts of the pipe, and it gets wider and, and thinner. Um, great. So another nice thing to note here is that I wrote this title as current is conserved within a single steady state fluid system. That's also the way we define a single steady state fluid system. Anywhere, if, con if current is conserved along whatever path you're tracing in along a system, then you know that's a steady state system. If the current is the same everywhere and is not changing, then you have one steady state fluid system. And that definition will be important because we can only use the equation that we're going to build when we have a steady state fluid system. So if we want to check, can I use it? I better have one conserved current. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Because the pipe is getting wider, the fluid has to slow down. And I get, yeah, I can, we, if we want to think about like why physically that has to be true, other than to just satisfy this equation, if, let's say the fluid was going the same speed everywhere in the pipe. So there was no difference in the speed between this section one and section two. That would mean that more fluid is flowing through section two than section one, right? Let's say section, like this is a gross like abstraction at this point, but let's say we get two molecules can fit through this narrow pipe at a time, but four molecules can fit through the wide pipe at a time because it's wider. If they're moving at the same speed, then you're gonna have a larger flow rate here, right? Because like at every second or every interval of time, you're gonna get four passing through the right pipe whereas in this one you're only gonna get two. So in order to make that work, we would need to be adding water or fluid into the system somewhere. Like you can't just generate two extra, right? Because this pipe flows into this pipe. And the only fluid that gets to pipe two comes from pipe one. So if pipe one's only feeding two molecules a second to pipe two, well, then pipe two can only have two molecules per second going through. So if pipe two is wider and more can go through at the same time, they have to move slower to account for the lower amount that's being fed from pipe one. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that would be, we'll look at something like that a bit later on. That would be not steady state, because then the current would be, would end up changing. But that's a good question. But for now, we're given that this is a steady state fluid system. Um, yeah, and the opposite is true too, where if the speed, well, I, I don't know. You can't have water build up or leak out or be added in. We only have one flow rate that's constrained to this closed pipe. Um, okay, so we just, now we define current. We know how it works, we know it's conserved, and we know how it's made up of, or how, it, how we can figure out what our current is from the speed of the flow and the cross-sectional area. Now let's talk about the energy density of that fluid, the properties of the fluid as it flows through a system. Um, and to do that, we need to introduce pressure. Pressure is something that you probably have a conceptual understanding of or an intuitive understanding of, right? If you dive underwater, you feel like an increase in pressure, right? You feel like pressure on your eardrums. If you inflate a balloon, you know you're increasing the pressure in it, right, by blowing the air into it, and that pressure applies a force on the balloon that causes it to expand, right? So we, we kind of know what pressure is, but how do we define it? 
Well, units-wise, it has units energy per volume, so it is an energy density, which, as we'll see, is why we can talk about it, why it works in tandem with other energy density systems. But uh, energy density actually is the same units as force per unit area. So joules, energy per meter cube volume, is the same as newtons, which is a unit of force per meter squared. So in the context of, since we're talking about energy density in Bernoulli's equation, which this is a piece of Bernoulli's equation, we're gonna think of it as an energy density. Pressure is energy density, which it is. But if you wanna think of it more, I guess intuitively, pressure is also can be expressed in, in this force per unit area. It is, still is the same pressure that we, we think of when we think of all the practical applications um, of how we experience pressure. Um, and pressure works in kind of a cool way. Um, so like we said, we have conservation, and that's not just of current, but it's also energy density. So if the fluid at point A has some energy, total energy density associated with it, as it flows through our steady state, at steady state fluid system, that total energy density has to stay the same at point A, point B, point C. However, we know that total energy can come from a bunch of different energy systems. Like I said before, there's kinetic, potential, thermal, so on and so forth. And so all those things can exchange energy density so long as the total stays the same. And that's essentially what Bernoulli's equation is. It's just accounting for all the changes in energy density as we flow through a circuit. So ones that we already mentioned and we'll talk about in more detail soon are potential energy density and kinetic energy density. And then now we add pressure onto that as well. Pressure is another energy density associated with the fluid as it flows through. And it acts as kind of a balancer in the checkbook of energy density, if you want to think of it that way. So this equation here is the sum of the changes in energy density as we flow through a circuit. And if the total energy density has to be the same, if the sum of the energy densities has to be the same, then the sum of the changes between two points have to add to zero, right? So if I increase one, that has to come from a decrease in the other. And that's why we sum all of the deltas. So these deltas are very important. And we also know that these deltas are changes in space. So this is like pressure change between point A and point B, potential energy density change between point A and point B, kinetic energy density change between point A and point B. The sum of all those changes between point A and point B has to be zero because point A and point B have to have the same total energy density associated with the fluid there. Okay, so pressure accounts for these changes. Um, what that means, I guess, is let's say both potential energy density and kinetic energy, energy density increase, right? These deltas are positive. Delta P, our change in pressure, has no choice but to be negative. And we'll see that's how pressure works. Pressure, it's hard to just intuit like what's gonna happen to pressure. We can't see it as easily as we can see these two or others, but it will have an effect, and that's to always make this energy conservation statement true. So let's go into more detail for the potential and kinetic energy density stuff, which you should have already seen in 7a a bit. Um, the version you see in 7a is just potential energy. Mass times gravitational acceleration, which just has one value for Earth, and different value on the moon, whatever, just how strong gravity is, times our height. The heavier something is, the higher up it is, the higher the potential energy, right? So if I increase my height, I increase my potential energy. Like we said, we're talking about densities now, though. Not, we don't care about total energy. So we just divide by volume, it's as simple as that. So our poten potential energy density, P over volume, is just we divide that MGH by volume. And if we write it this way, apply the volume to M, which we can, we can just, you know, it's just division, we can move it around however, however we want here. Mass divided by volume, we already have a term for that. It's density. So our potential energy density, now very conveniently, instead of MGH, we have rho GH, which is the density of the fluid times G times H. So now our potential energy density just depends on what the fluid is and how high up it is. And if I have some fluid with some density, if it has a higher height, it has a higher potential energy density. The way of thinking about it is really the exact same as potential energy that we're used to. Um, right, okay, so let's do a little example. Well, first, I guess, put it in context. 
This is just a piece of that equation we saw before. I got rid of kinetic energy density for this case. Um, so right now we're just looking at a cup of water. There's no flow here, which is fine. This equation still works when there's no flow. But if nothing's moving, then our, even though we haven't talked about it yet, we know if there's no motion, there's not going to be kinetic energy, right? No kinetic energy density. So the only energy density systems we have at play in this cup of water are pressure and potential energy density. And so we just know that the sum of those two, of the changes in those two energy density systems have to cancel out. So let's look at the pressure difference between point one and point two. So we'll use this equation, which describes, again, the changes in energy density systems between two points to examine the difference in, in pressure between point one and point two. So I'll give you a sec to think about this. I'll open the clicker poll. How does the pressure between point one and point two change? And if you can't read them, point one is this one, point two is this one. They have the same height. So like I mentioned before, I don't look at clicker results after class. Like I'll never go back and look at what you answered or even that you were here or anything. It's just a way for you to give it a shot and for me to see where people are at. So don't be afraid to just answer something. There are zero consequences and complete anonymity. OK, I'm going to stop us there. So really nice job with this one. Um, the pressure difference between them is zero. So there is no pressure difference. Intuitively, that makes sense, right? If you, I mean, this could be a cup of water. Think of it as a pool, right? You dive underwater, you feel that increase in pressure, but then does the pressure change whether I swim to the left or the right or forward or back? No, it only depends on whether, uh, how deep you are. So the same thing comes out of this equation here. The sum of the change in pressure and the change in potential energy have to add up to zero. So if my change in potential energy density is zero because the height is the same. Going from one, and one to two and back is just changing where I am on the, at the same plane. The h is the same. Delta h is zero, so delta p over volume is zero. And so delta p, or our change in pressure, has to equal zero. So our equation matches up with our intuition, with our expectation. Let's work together to do a little bit more involved uh, of a calculation, let's find the pressure difference between 1 and 3. So what if I start at point 1 and dive down to 3? Well, I use the same equation, except now this potential energy density term is not 0, right? Because point 1 and point 3 are not at the same height. So just a reminder, when we have the way we use like deltas in equations, it's final minus initial. So if we're starting at point 1 and diving down to point 3, my initial is 1, my final is 3. So my delta P is P3 minus P1, final pressure minus initial pressure. And my change of potential energy density is rho G H final minus H initial, or H3 minus H1. So this is something that like conceptually is easier than it is practically. Like it's, you just got to be careful when you're doing accounting of these to make sure you get your finals and initials consistent when you're writing out these equations. And I encourage you not to skip this step um, where I wrote H3 and H1, P3, P1, whatever, um, at least not early on, just because writing it all out and understanding exactly what's going into an equation before you start you know, putting in values and zeros and stuff is important. Um, but it simplifies, if we solve this equation, to get P3 equals P1 plus rho GH. So how do we interpret that? That means the pressure at point three, at the bottom of the cup, is whatever the pressure was at point one, plus some amount, plus some positive amount. And is that what our intuition tells us? If we are at some level in water, we dive down deeper from one to three, we experience an increase in pressure. And that is indeed what this shows us, that the pressure at point three is pressure, whatever the pressure at point one was, plus some amount. And this is what we call an absolute pressure. It just means that we're starting from zero. Like this is, this is the pressure at point three, because we added on what our starting value was. 
another way to think of it, I mean, it's really doing the same work, but let's say we just want the relative pressure change between point one and point two, instead of, or point three, instead of expanding this delta P13 into P3 minus P1, I can just leave it as the difference in pressure between point one and point three, solve it, and I get a very similar equation. Well, it means the same exact thing, just that the change in pressure between point one and three is rho GH. That if I go from point one to point three, I experience this change in pressure. And this we might call a gauge pressure, because it, it's not an absolute pressure. This is not the pressure at point three. It's the increase in pressure at point three in relation to point one. And that's something that we often use because I guess we're describing pressure changes in the world. Often it's just in relation to the atmosphere around us, right? We don't often care about the absolute pressure. We just care about the difference in pressure. So I, like that terminology I think is a little clunky, but and I, I hope, it, hope it makes sense that we can either talk about absolute or pressure in relation to things. And both can be used to answer like the same question. Like if you were to write this on a quiz or this on a quiz, um, as long as you can explain what that means and it's clear that you're answering the question, then it doesn't really matter. Um, okay, so what we found as potential energy decreases, pressure, or in other words, as we dive down, pressure increases. So that's our first look at like how this delta P term, this change in pressure, is kind of like the balancer for this like accounting sheet, right? I have some total amount of energy density. In this case, I dove down, so I got rid of some potential. And if my potential energy density goes down, then it has to go to somewhere. And the only, case it, the only place it can go here is pressure. Pressure is the, the equalizer. Same thing would happen in the reverse. If I started at point three and went up to point one, my potential energy would increase. And as a result, that's gotta come from somewhere. We spend some of the pressure. You can think of it, the pressure goes down. So pressure is gonna be like kind of the last piece you fill in um, to see, yeah, there's not something we can just like directly observe for pressure. Unless we take advantage of this potential energy change um, to make a pressure gauge. So there's a lot that's gonna go on in this slide. The math is really the same exact thing that I just did. But there's a lot of concepts that go into turning that math into something useful like a pressure gauge. But if you're comfortable with this, then in the future, you won't have to you know, consciously do all these steps. They should become a little more natural. So first thing, forget this top pipe, this vertical pipe coming out of the top. We just have a pipe with fluid flowing through the bottom from left to right. That's it, pipe with water flowing through it. Then we wanna know what the pressure in that pipe is. And we don't have a great way to, to do that. You can't, it's not like potential energy, you can look at the height, kinetic energy, you can look at the area or the speed, but there's no way we can just like observe the pressure. So I'm gonna use a standpipe as a pressure gauge and we'll walk through how we do that. So we stick this standpipe on top and what happens because the water in the pipe has some pressure, the water starts to go up into the pipe we put on it. I mean, imagine if you just, you know, went into the bathroom and there's water flowing through a pipe, you just stab the side of the pipe, water sprays out because the water in there is, has some pressure that's greater than the atmosphere around, so it's gonna spray out. Instead of letting it spray out, we're gonna let it flow into a vertical tube. And it's going to fill up into the vertical tube, and then for reasons that might be clear or we'll discuss soon, that comes to a stop. So if we, if, as long as the, pipe's tall, the top pipe is tall enough, the fluid's gonna rise up and then come to a stop. And that is all we need to determine the pressure in the pipe below to measure that height. So to get there, uh, first let's identify one important thing, that there's actually multiple fluid systems here. This isn't all just one fluid system now. Remember our definition of a single steady state fluid system or at least one of the requirements, is that the current has to be the same everywhere. Current is conserved throughout this circuit. And if we look, that's not true for the setup we just described. There's one fluid system going along the bottom, right? This is just water flowing through a pipe, flow rate's the same everywhere, great. But once this comes to equilibrium, this top pipe is just stationary. The fluid flows up to a certain point, and now it's just a column of water sitting there. That has a flow rate of zero, right? There's no flow. So clearly this bottom pipe and this standpipe are not the same fluid system. They're in contact, but they're not the same fluid system. 
And then there's a third fluid system, which is the air around us. This top pipe is open to the air, and the air has some pressure associated with it. Um, and also the air is just a different fluid altogether. So that's definitely a different fluid system because air and water, well, they're different fluids. So different fluid, different current means we have a different fluid system. In this case, even though it seems pretty simple, <laughs> there's actually three fluid systems that we can describe as they're labeled here. However, different fluid systems can be related to one another if they're in contact because at the surface where they're in contact, assuming it's in equilibrium, like nothing's moving, if that contact point is stationary, then you know that those two fluid systems share a pressure at that surface. One way to think of it is just like, let's say you and a friend were like pushing on each other's hands, right? If one of you is pushing harder than the other, you're not gonna stay stationary. Like if you push harder than your friend, you're gonna push them back, right? So if these points of contact labeled P1 and PATM, the bottom of the standpipe and where the standpipe meets the air, if those are stationary, you know that at those contact points, the air and the water in the standpipe have the same pressure because they're pushing on each other exactly as like equal and opposite. Same thing at the bottom of the fluid columns, the fluid in that column is pushing on the water in the pipe just as hard as the water in the pipe is pushing back up on it. In other words, they have equal pressure. So that's a way we found to relate the pressure at the, in the air to the pressure in the standpipe and the pressure in the standpipe to the pressure in the bottom pipe. So now all we need to do is figure out what's happening in the standpipe in between its connection to the air and its connection to the pipe below. Yeah, exactly. An example of that would be if, when I first stick the pipe, like the, the standpipe onto the bottom one, it's gonna be empty, right? And over time, it's gonna fill up. So during that, we, we can't, we, maybe later in the course, but we don't have the machinery to describe that yet while it's filling up. But once it comes to a stop, it reaches steady state, then we can talk about it. Okay, um, so like I said, we wanna relate the top now of the standpipe to the bottom. That is one fluid system, right? Going from PATM to P1, just through the standpipe, that's flowing through one steady state fluid system, just a column of water sitting there. And now that's the same exact math that we just did, right? Delta P plus delta P over volume. There is flow in the bottom tube, so there would be kinetic energy associated with this bottom pipe. But again, we're not looking at that fluid system. We're only looking at the fluid system one at a time, the one that is the stationary standpipe that has no flow, so no kinetic energy. And so uh, we can do just the change between the bottom and the top, let's say. So in this case, final minus initial, PATM minus P1. This would be giving us the pressure difference going from point one to PATM. It doesn't matter which one in this case you pick is final and which one is initial because there's no flow. It's just they have to be consistent for each term. So in this case, PATM minus P1, that means for my potential energy term, this has to be the height associated with PATM, which it is at height H above the bottom, and this has to be the height associated with P1, which we assume is zero. So as long as you're consistent in between these terms here, it doesn't matter. In general, when, we, when there is flow, you wanna go in the direction of the flow. So if I'm flowing from left to right, then my initial should be on the left and my final should be further along the stream on the right, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But using that same math we did before, we find that the pressure at point one is equal to the pressure at the top plus some amount, rho GH. So it has to do with the potential energy change. As we go down, we give up potential energy. And so as a result, our pressure increases is one way to see it. Or just mathematically, we get an increase of rho GH. And even though it looks weird, like you know, diving through like a little cylinder, it's, it's the same idea as when you dive down under a pool. We're starting at the air, we're starting at one atmosphere of pressure, and we dive down underwater, and so the pressure increases as we dive down, and we know exactly how much, because we know the density of water, we know the gravitational strength, and we know the height, and so we can find the pressure change, the difference in pressure between the air and the pipe below us. So assuming we know the pressure of the air, which we do, one atmosphere, here's 
the units. I'm, you'll never have to memorize this number. Um, but assuming we know the pressure of the atmosphere, we can find the pressure in the pipe below. So this is one example where this expression is written out as absolute pressure. That would be the absolute pressure at point one, but I'm not so concerned about the absolute pressure. The more interesting part is how much different is it than the air around us. So I could also write this as like delta P, one to PATM, whatever, is just equal to this. There's an increase in pressure from the top to the bottom, and as a result, we have the pressure in our bottom tube. Um, so another uh, kind of intricacy here is that P1 is at the top of the pipe, right? So there is technically a change in height between P1 and the center of that pipe on the bottom and the bottom. However, in general, we're gonna make the assumption, unless told explicitly otherwise, that might happen once or twice, but we're gonna make the assumption that the height difference between, like within one pipe is negligible. So you know what, it, like along the direction of flow, if we're perpendicular to it, this pipe is at one height. We don't really care about little differences within the pipe. And that's a pretty good approximation. Here the scale is kind of out of whack, like the, the difference in height in that standpipe where we do care is pretty comparable to the width of the pipe, but I don't, that's just so we can see it better. In general, the height within a pipe is negligible, so whatever this pressure at point one is, where they meet is the pressure, you could say, of the whole pipe below, yeah. Exactly, yeah, once it filled up. So yeah, a couple, like a, just a couple different ways of thinking about it might be uh, that the bottom of this column of water has now become basically like another piece of the pipe. Like this water that's sitting in the standpipe above there is weighing down on the fluid flowing in the pipe below it, keeping it from pushing up into there. So it's become a barrier. There's an, and that, that only happens when enough fluid flows into that top one to push down hard enough for, to keep more from flowing in. In other words, when the pressures are equalized. So to back up, standpipe, all we did was allow some water to leave, measure how much potential energy it could spend until it ran out of pressure, right? We have some pressure in the bottom pipe, we allow it to spend that pressure on potential energy, and then once it reaches zero, runs out of potential energy, we've essentially measured how much pressure it started with. Yeah. It, it's moving kind of on one side. So P1, it, the water is flowing past P1. So the, I guess once things come to steady state, the water is still flowing along the pipe, but again, we're thinking about it just like a cross section at a time. So P1 could be this whole kind of plane of the pipe. At this point, P1, the pressure is the same within this bottom pipe, no matter what that. Right, like in the, in the standpipe, we're talking about vertical, because there is a, a noticeable important height change. In the bottom pipe, we're just, yeah, then it becomes, it's all on the same height, we only care about uh, horizontal. And we, we don't have any reason to believe the pressure would change, as we flow along this pipe, but it could. I guess we just need more information. Yeah, so we're thinking about the pressure now, I guess, at the gate that's right below point one. Okay, so now we've uh, talked a lot about the potential energy density, how it works, how to use it as a gauge of pressure, and how it fits into this energy density balancing equation. Let's add another term, our kinetic energy density. So very similar process. We've seen kinetic energy. 1 half mv squared, the higher the mass, the more kinetic energy, the higher the speed, the more kinetic energy. So the two changes we need to make, we want a delta, we want a change in kinetic energy between point A and point B, and we don't want just energy, we want energy density. Because again, we care at the, about the behavior at different points, not the total. So we'll just add a delta, make it a difference between two points, and divide by volume. And same thing, the result of dividing by volume turns the mass into a density. We don't care what the total mass of water in the system is, we just care about the density of water, or oil, or whatever fluid we're talking about. 
and we get so one half rho instead of m times delta v squared. This is a mistake that you'll make, I'll probably make it happens, but the best way to correct it is just make it once or however many times you gotta make it and correct it. You need to do delta v squared, which gives the like vb squared minus va squared, not delta v squared, which would be vb minus va squared, because that's always positive, that, that's just wrong. It's important that you square it first and then find the difference. You're finding the, it's not some new expression, it's the potential energy, or sorry, the kinetic energy density here and the kinetic energy density here and then find the difference. So yeah, this, the order of these parentheses and this delta and this uh, exponent, ex exponent um, is important. But again, you'll make the mistake, I promise, <laughs> and then we'll fix it. Um, okay, so what causes kinetic energy density to change or how do we even recognize it within a fluid system? Right, because it depends on speed, how fast is this fluid moving, but we don't really have a good way of measuring the speed of a fluid. You, if I just gave you a clear pipe and sent some water through it, there's really nothing you could do to tell me just how fast the water is flowing from observing it. However, if we're concerned with the change in speed, we can take advantage of a relationship that we found before. And that relationship is the one between flow rate, current, I, all, th all those things are the same, current is flow rate is this, we're calling letter I, is equal to the product of the cross-sectional area times the speed of the flow. And we know that our cross-sectional, or sorry, that our current, that I is conserved everywhere, right? So as long as we have one steady state fluid system, this value I is the same for point A or gate A and point B. So that lets us relate this area times speed area times speed here, and so we know if the area changes, that gives us an idea of how much the speed changes between A and B. So if we just rearrange this I equals AV to V equals IA, in other words, the speed of the fluid flow is equal to the flow rate divided by the cross-sectional area, I is not changing, like we just said, so if we increase A, increase the area of the pipe, like I've done from A to B, it gets wider, that means a decrease in speed. For that same reason, the, the flow rate is conserved, so if we give more space for the fluid to flow through, it slows down. And if the velocity, and so area increase means speed decrease, and a speed decrease means a smaller kinetic energy density, so a kinetic energy decrease as well. So in this case, the pipe gets wider, and that means the fluid slows down, which means the kinetic energy density also goes down. So for that reason, we'll say, like height was the potential energy density indicator. Area is the kinetic energy density indicator. Even though speed is the thing that we plug into the equation, or like we're, you know, we're used to thinking about kinetic energy in terms of speed, we can't see it. So area is our indicator, just knowing that it kind of works opposite, that an increase in area means a decrease in kinetic energy density, and vice versa. So let's, get, let's put all this together synthesize it and look at this setup that we've been looking at in terms of pressure, potential energy density change, and kinetic energy density change. So now, this is that equation that we started with early on. It's just summing together all of the changes in energy density that occur throughout a fluid circuit, and we know those have to sum to zero because we have conservation of energy density. And I've given you the little expressions for kinetic energy density change and potential energy density change. So first, I'll, we'll ask a few questions about this one and then come back to the answers at the end. But how does, what is the sign of delta Ke over volume? So from one to two, flowing from left to right, what is the sign of the change in kinetic energy density? I'll give you 10 more seconds or so. All right. 
So now I'll stop that one. Remember your answer. Now let's move on, to, and we'll go over all these at the end. What's the sign of the potential energy density change? I'll give you 20 or 30 seconds for this. And remember, we're going from left to right. So the change would be going from area one to area two. All right, I'm gonna stop that one. And now final question, what is the sign of the change in pressure? We decided what our change in potential energy density, we decided what our change in kinetic energy density, what is the resulting change in pressure? All right, I'm going to stop us in a couple more seconds. OK. So this one was a little trickier. You did a pretty good job. So let's first go over the first two pieces, kinetic energy density. The area, as we go from the left to the right, increases. And so if the area increases to conserve current, or conserve flow rate, the speed has to decrease. And if the speed decreases, we know the kinetic energy density also decreases. So our kinetic energy density is negative. Less than, this term is negative less than zero. For potential energy, we go from a lower pipe to a higher pipe. And in this case, like I said before, the, we assume the height difference within a pipe, unless otherwise specified, to be negligible. So it's best to just look at the center of the pipe, which clearly the center gets higher up. The height increases as we go from left to right. And so our potential energy density increases as well. So that's greater than zero. So now we're left with this equation up top where our change in pressure plus a positive potential energy density change minus a kinetic energy density change, so a negative, equals zero. So we actually whoops, need more information to determine the pressure change. Because we know that there's an increase coming, so there's, we're spending some. Sorry, there's an increase from kinetic energy density. And in other words, we're getting some energy back from kinetic because our kinetic energy density is decreasing. We're spending some of it on potential energy density because the height is increasing. But we don't know the relation between those two. We don't know which one's bigger. I would need to give you numbers to plug in and see which one works out to, to be bigger. If the kinetic energy density change was more significant, then we'd end up with a negative, and so the pressure change would have to be positive to account for that. If the kinetic energy density change was smaller, the potential energy density change was bigger, we'd end up with a net positive between those two, and our pressure change would have to be negative to account for that. So pressure, this is kind of how I was saying, like pressure is the balancer for this equation. We figure out what the other things are, and then pressure will accommodate it to satisfy this conservation of energy statement that we have at the top. Uh, questions about this one? So for the tons of people that said that the change would be zero, totally get where you're coming from. The thinking is right, that you have some increase, some decrease, so those cancel. There wouldn't need to be a pressure change, but then that's possible if those two were exactly equal in magnitude, but just not enough information. All right, um, final two pieces here. Um, other energy density systems, if you want to think of it. Thermal energy density, we could think of as just an addition to this equation here, just like we could spend some and get some from kinetic and potential. Same thing with thermal. I could take some of my energy density and spend it on heating up the system. However, this one's a little unique. Um, 
because once you spend energy density on heat, on thermal energy density, you can't get it back. So let's talk about how, how the thermal energy density increases. For that, we need resistance. So in, in reality, all fluid systems have some degree of resistance. A lot of the problems we do, we'll just say, assume friction or resistance is negligible, and that's an ideal case, but that just means this value R, the resistance of the pipe, is zero. The value of our delta E thermal over volume, so the change in thermal energy density, is just a product of the flow rate, our current, times this value R. So the higher the value of the resistance, the larger amount of thermal energy is created. The higher the amount of flow rate, the larger the amount of thermal energy is created. I think it's a pretty intuitive thing. It's just equal to I times R. But, so once you spend your energy on thermal energy density, so I flow through a pipe that has some friction, some resistance, and the heat, they're like create heat, the fluid heats up, its thermal energy density increases, you can't just get it back. Like for kinetic energy density, we could have the pipe get wider and then narrower and wider again, whatever, that's a system that can give and take. Same thing with potential. A pipe can go up and down and up and down, potential energy goes up and down, give and take. But with heat, if water th flows through a pipe and heats up, it's therm we spend some energy density on thermal energy density, you can't just get that back and turn it back into pressure. Right? The pipe is going to absorb it. It's going to be released and like, diffused out into the atmosphere. So you're going to lose that thermal energy. So I think it's better to think of thermal energy as just a piece on the other side of the equation that gives us a net loss. Because right? it's not an energy density system that can participate in this give and take. It's just, I have a fluid system, and it has pressure and potential energy and kinetic energy density changing. And then if there's resistance, then I know that the total change, instead of being zero before to satisfy conservation of energy, my total change, when I add up all the changes, is going to be negative. Because I did lose some of that energy. It wasn't a closed system. I dissipated some of that energy into thermal energy. So even though the top statement is technically correct, I think it's better to think about this form of the equation, where on the left, we have all of the energy density systems that are changing throughout a circuit. And on the right, we just have the total amount of lost energy. Yeah. Exactly. Um, the other thing you'll notice, there's no delta here, right? It's just IR. That's because resistance just happens in a length of pipe. We'll talk more about that in detail, about like how to quantify that. But resistance occurs in between two points. Um, so not just difference between point A and point B. It's just if there's resistance in between them, you will get a net loss in between them. Um, so I'm going to stop here. We're just shy of having our complete Bernoulli equation, um, the last slide of this. So we're just a few minutes away from this. I pro it's, it's a lot, but this is just summing up the entire lecture. I will s take off uh, where we finished next lecture, and I'll also send out maybe a Canvas announcement clearing some things up. But I'll see you next week. <laughs>